welcome to the second episode of the Finance for Telcrium talk show. Today's discussion is all about open banking and what it looks like in this part of the region when it comes to collaboration between fintechs and bank. This discussion is very timely given that we have Singapore Fintech Festival and Hong Kong Fintech Week coming up next month and we're expecting a lot of guests in this part of the region again. Joining me in this discussion today is Deepali who is the founder of Lean in Fintech Asia. Dipali has more than 20 years of experience scaling businesses and financial and banking technologies for large organizations and Fintech startups. Big round of applause for Dipali. <laughs> I also have with me Michael from IDC. He heads research for IDC Asia Pacific. Michael is the go-to analyst for advice on the technology investments that need to be made for product innovation, big data, customer analytics, core banking systems, risk management, and customer channel effectiveness. He's currently also focusing a lot of time on research on the rise of fintech opportunities in Asia Pacific. So Mike, what is your take on open banking? Would they follow the, this definition in this part of the region? And how do they see open banking and its impact penetrating into the wider society and the industry as a whole? Right. So we at IDC Financial Insights, we've looked at the 14 key Asia Pacific markets, um, especially in the context of this open banking phenomenon that we are expecting. There are some markets like Singapore and Australia, for example, that would uh, probably follow the trajectory of uh, the European market in being able to see regulations uh, and the regulators themselves define what open banking strategies they should be and how exactly the terms of open banking should be undertaken in these markets. There are, however, some markets, especially the developing markets, where open banking is primarily going to be led by the big players especially because they have the cloud and the ability to influence this collaboration between the banks as well as the fintech providers. Well, open banking is an opportunity to transform the value of banking service. The move to bank as a platform or banking as a service will redefine the future of financial services. Dipali, you've been in this industry for a long time. You know, you've seen all sides of the spectrum. You've, you know, from the consulting firm's perspective, banks, transformation happening at banks, and now you're working with a lot of fintechs across Asia Pacific. I mean, you're flying all over the world to consult uh, the fintechs as well. So what is your take in terms of uh, the adoption from a fintech's perspective? What's going on in their minds when they are sort of launching uh, new APIs, new applications, and this sort of relationship with the banks? Yeah. So it's uh, interesting you spoke of banking as a service. And I think um, a key um, differentiator from the past to now is that earlier uh, banking was like a walled garden. Uh, you know, nobody could really get in. It, the, there was a trust has always been a, a, a key, but uh, along, along with that, we also had customers who were either in or out. You know, there was a very clear divide. Uh, but now with uh, the kind of open API economy that we're seeing, you're seeing the doors opening and uh, fintechs playing a big uh, role in that. And that really comes, initially it starts with, let's say, just account information, right? And how can, for instance, uh, money management be provided in a much, much more exhaustive manner to clients? Right. Second, from a payments perspective, uh, how can that be made faster, real time, and really, really simple? Right. So you have a lot of fintech players uh, latching on to that uh, category, and um, and then you have third, which is lending, both from a retail uh, customers' perspective as well as the medium and small enterprises' perspective. They've been uh, pretty much left outside of the whole banking domain for a long, long time, primarily uh, for reasons such as very strict documentation for, for reasons such as they don't really have the kind of uh, you know, resources when it comes to availing of uh, financial uh, lending. So all of these have opened up doors for fintechs to come in and uh, say that, hey, I've got a solution here uh, where you can now uh, make yourselves available as a service wherever your customers are, rather than them coming to where your walled garden has been. 
Interesting, you talked about uh, you know simplicity aspect, you know of, of of this convergence that's happening, and you also talk about banks going to the to the, to the consumers, and and I have an interesting example to share in the last two weeks. Um, you know, um, I'm sort of driving this this thing about ca being cashless all the time, and every time I took a cab, for some reason my Grab Pay doesn't work, and and some of my friends would know every time I'm sort of. It's not working. I don't have cash, and it's not connecting to my cards. And that gave me an opportunity to talk to all the cab drivers to download Payla. And uh, and interestingly, that during the 10 minutes journey between office to um, you know home, you know uh, we have conversations now happening whether it's Payla or PayNow that we should be downloading, and and you know what's the best form of online transactions, right. but. The, the, on a sort of more uh, serious note, this really makes me feel good that you know consumers are now being more aware of you know where the society is headed towards more cashless and and sort of more ease of use for the end consumer. What yeah. is very impressive with this open banking trend definitely is that the customer is finally in control of the relationship, right? Uh, the second fundamental principle of the sharing of data, for example, is based on the uh, principle that uh, the data is now owned by the customer, right? And there's a lot of implications to that. Previously, we were thinking that the banks in, owned customer data in, within the walled garden, so to speak. But finally, with regulation, but also the banks uh, thinking about this themselves, is that um, the customer has the ownership and every right and control of his or her data. And this is exemplified by your example of the customer finally being in the literal driver's seat of the relationship, of determining how I should pay, how, should, how I should engage with a financial institution, and how I need to be served by a financial institution. What are the benefits you see with open banking to the, um, I would say, end user or end consumer, as well as the, the participants in this you know, collaborative economy? So Mike, uh, first, you may want to go. Well, the, one of the clear benefits that we've been talking about for quite some time is the availability of credit services finally made available to those who had credit, thin credit files, for example, or those uh, customers that did not, simply did not have any customer information within a traditional financial institution. Finally, you've got fintechs that are able to provide that kind of information uh, that will be used by the banks themselves to make credit decisions, right? And this is a very great opportunity for open banking in the Asian region where 40%, 45% of the population across the region would still be underbanked or uh, really don't have traditional financial services relationships. So this ability to uh, get into traditional financial services is very important um, and would help in the financial inclusion objectives of markets across the region. Vipali, your, your views on, on, on the benefits aspect. Yeah, so the benefits, um, uh, if you look at cite some examples, right, of banks which have actively launched um, open banking-led services. So uh, referring to your point, Mike, on the uh, thin files, right, on credit scoring. So that has been such a big pain point for uh, both retail as well as a lot of the unbanked MSMEs, right? And um, so you have uh, certain players like in, in the US, you have JPMC, which works with uh, OnDeck, uh, which really does a lot of the credit scoring. And then that's kind of handed over to, to the banks on, in a very, very easy uh, way. Uh, in Asia, um, you have uh, DBS Bank, uh, which is working with uh, companies like Moolah Sense, uh, you know, to kind of make uh, this uh, a similar kind of facility available. And uh, Moolah Sense, uh, you have actually marketplace lending is a huge, huge uh, uh, space here in Asia. You have companies like fintechs like Fundnel, uh, Moolah Sense, funding societies, all of them uh, providing excellent services to uh, otherwise um, uh, lower banked kind of uh, MSMEs, right? And uh, uh, here what they do is that they uh, provide, they have the ability to provide uh, lending from various different sources. It's like a crowdfunding marketplace, right? But on top of that, what they do is they can link to various banks. So DBS is in that sense linking to, to some of these players. And these banks then can come in and 
uh, provide services to an otherwise untapped segment. Regardless of what the open banking strategies are, it is very clear that open banking primarily will be made out of three uh, fundamental principles, and that is the principle of working with third parties. This principle of openness is gaining quite a bit of traction in the industry. Suddenly, we're talking about how banks who are very traditional, who were tr very traditional in their approach, are suddenly talking about how exactly they're going to partner with the fintech players that they thought were enemies of the state, probably, uh, for quite some time. The second principle of open banking would be that of the sharing of functionalities, applications, and data. But data is, I think, more important among all the uh, capabilities that the institution needs to share. The ability of the institution to share data of the customer and to be able to acquire data from third parties is going to be very fundamental. And Finastra is launching the Open Banking Index, I believe, as well, with yes. IDC. Do you want to give a bit of a that's sneak going to be peek into very, that? That's going to be very controversial, and we're very excited about this, primarily because uh, we're putting together a list of the top open banking ready institutions in the 14 key Asia Pacific markets. So 250 institutions interviewed uh, and we ultimately identified who were the leaders in this space. You see the usual suspects of those yeah. who use open banking as branding exercises, for example, to say we have 150, 200 APIs. They are featuring quite well there, but there are also institutions that um, would not really make sense in any list primarily because they're small, but these are the smaller players that would uh, really uh, have uh, created a vision of open banking that works in their respective markets. So very exciting. Uh, Let's stay index. tuned for this open banking index that's coming out in a few weeks from now. Switching gears, let's talk more about collaboration between fintechs and banks. Um, uh, you know, uh, would you be able to share sort of some examples where good collaboration is happening and, and maybe the areas of opportunity that has not been untapped so far? There is a company, for instance, like uh, Matchmove, right, which is uh, which provides uh, payments as a platform uh, based on top of your mobile. Uh, now, if you look at it just in ASEAN, right, you have like let's say about 700 million kind of population, of which almost 70 percent is unbanked, and uh, whereas mobile penetration is so deep. Uh, so just with something like that, you can have uh, a huge uh, kind of a market opening and uh, players like uh, Matchmove, players like uh, uh, in, in, in the US you have, and, and in Europe you have Dola, so which are kind of making a lot of inroads and really tapping that, that whole customers, which otherwise are not even having maybe a bank account. Um, so you're talking numbers uh, globally as much as maybe like a billion plus uh, of adults who don't have bank accounts. And then when you zero in on the region, again, you have a huge uh, kind of population. So it's simplifying the banking experience for all. That is what the key. And, and while you guys were talking, I was asking my AI to take a bit of synopsis of all the notes. And here are my four key, key takeaways. Collaboration is the new innovation, clearly. The open banking and the role of fintechs is going to be critical in the coming days and weeks. Banks and fintechs need to work towards, you know, work towards the, the sort of common uh, end goal, which is the customer. The move to a bank as a platform and the new business model is clearly emerging. The platform-based business uh, model has taken hold in this digital economy and is starting to disrupt all the, the banking industry in the region. Democratization of software, some, somewhere the, the world that I come from, and dematerialization of banks, uh, which is banking as a service. So move to bank as a platform, some more sort of jargons I'm putting in over here, or banking as a service will redefine the future of financial services. And last of all, which is I think it should have been the number one uh, sort of aspect, which is the, the key, and, and it has come across consistently across all our conversations, is customer. Customer experience is the only differentiator between banks and banking services. Banking service, banking customers, both retail as well as corporate customers, are becoming ever more demanding. And hence, um, you know, the open banking clearly is the uh, the new sort of future of financial services. With this, we end our second episode of the Financial 12 PM Talk Show. Thank you, our well, um, our, our wonderful guests and the wonderful audience over here. Thank you.